Yes, good afternoon and welcome to all of you. Uh, my name is JJ White. I'm also a librarian at the Coppell Library. And um, it's my privilege today to introduce James Everett. Uh, he's our speaker. And he is an archeological steward for the Texas Historical Commission and the immediate past president of both the Texas Archaeological Society and the North Texas Ar Archaeological Society. Sorry about that. He joined both archaeological societies in 1970. So thank you, James. And uh, please go ahead. Thank you, very, thank you very much. I'm going to try to hit the screen sharing now and see if we can be successful with that. And Okay, does everybody see the screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Well, as, as you know, the subject today is Native American cultures of North Texas. Uh, I have a subtitle called 16,000 years in 40 minutes. So we're gonna have to be running along here pretty fast and covering a lot of material. But as uh, Sarah indicated, if you have questions, you can type them into chat or uh, at the end, I, we should be able to entertain questions also uh, that you just uh, talk to us about. As we get started, I want to thank the Capel Library and the community builders for this invitation, and especially Janice White and Sarah Silverthorne, who have been so nice to work with, and, and they have facilitated practice sessions, and, and they uh, allowed me to meet with the community builders a few weeks ago, and, and that was very helpful in getting ready for this. I also want to give my compliments to the Capel Historical Society. I uh, used their website uh, quite a bit in researching this, especially as uh, this subject pertains to your area, and uh, a lot of very good material on that site. Jan Lorraine, who is on with us here uh, as one of the, the listeners, contributed a lot to that, and I recommend it to anybody locally there. If you have interest in your history and haven't looked at that site, uh, I recommend that you do so. I mentioned the uh, community builders and the meeting that I attended a while back. In the invitation that I got to do this program, there was a statement from Janice that said that uh, this group wanted to promote a deeper understanding of the people we share the world with, which I think is a very good goal, something that we really need today. And when I was at the community builders meeting, Mohammed said that uh, the group wanted to know each other and know about each other in the community. Well, as far as Native Americans go, uh, the latest census that I found had about 0.34% of your local residents are Native Americans. And in Dallas County, about 1.1% were Native American or Alaska Natives. So not a high percentage, but a very important group. And I'll point out, of course, at one point, not that long ago, 100% of Dallas County and Capel area residents were Native Americans. So that brings up the question, who? Who do you think was here? What tribes do you think lived here? And uh, at this point, we can uh, unmute if you would like to venture a guess. When I do this uh, presentation in person, it's always very interesting to see the answers that people give. So I'll let you unmute and tell me who you think lived here in the past. Comanche. Comanche. Anybody else? All right, well, let's, let's just take a look at this. And this is my uh, very subtle reminder that I wanna time my presentation so I don't go too much over time here. Um, this area that we live in is really a crossroads, a crossroads of ecosystems and as a result, a crossroads of cultures. If you look at the map that we have here, you know, to the east we have the uh, piney woods in East Texas that blends kind of in then to the Blackland Prairie. And as we go west, here is the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And then we get into the cross timbers, some of which occur right through here in Arlington and then on into Parker County. Then we get into the plains and the high plains. So we're at a crossroads of ecosystems and cultures. I thought I would start looking first at the early history of this area. 
And the very first records that we have from this North Texas area come to us from a person who is recording the Luis de Moscoso uh, adventure expedition. Moscoso took over for Hernando de Soto, who died uh, probably in Arkansas, maybe in Louisiana, but uh, to the east of us. And Moscoso brought the Spanish uh, troops through North Texas. Um, he went as far west as a village he called Guasco. It may have been on the Brazos. It might have been on the Trinity right in this area. And some people even say it was on Village Creek. But the point is they were, they were coming through this area looking for uh, things of value and also, of course, trying to get to New Spain, which ultimately became Mexico, down to the southwest. They didn't find any treasure here, really, but they did find people who spoke a, a Catalan <laughs> language and who grew corn and, and other crops. Unfortunately, this uh, Moscoso group also stirred up a lot of conflict with the natives. They burned some villages, they tortured and killed some Native Americans, and kind of set the tone for a lot of the historical interaction in this area, unfortunately. They proceeded a little further west from here, and maybe as far as the Llano Estacado, they ran into some people who did not speak Caddo um, and who were not uh, crop growers. They were uh, nomads hunting bison or buffalo, and it might have been the Tonkawas. And we're going to talk about a lot of these folks as we go along. The Spaniards settled a lot of South and East Texas, but they really didn't do a lot in our area are in the Panhandle, partly because of the, what they called the Norteños. These were Comanches in Wichita who really posed a threat to the Spaniards who were trying to settle this area. You probably have heard of the San Saba or San Saba mission that was wiped out in 1758 by Comanches in Wichita's. Uh, the Spaniards decided to punish the Native Americans. They came north the, the next year and they ran into Comanches and in, in, uh, Wichita's at Spanish Fort up in Monte County, and they were thoroughly defeated, the, Span the Spaniards were, and they retreated. Later on in the Republic of Texas time, we had a big invasion of European and, U and U.S. settlers, a multicultural invasion, one author called it, with Germans and, and uh, U.S. citizens coming in. Unfortunately, they brought diseases with them and smallpox and cholera wiped out a large portion of the Native Americans in this area in the 1830s and 40s. It was a period of conflict. President Hi, uh, did you remember that this is the time for the libraries? Oh. Shall I proceed? Yes, yeah, JJ. Go can ahead. you all hear all right? Yes, we can yeah. hear you. Okay. Uh, President Lamar of the Republic uh, basically declared war on the Indians of our area, and the Texas Rangers were formed during this time to uh, especially fight Comanches. This period was a period of a lot of movement and migration and a lot of cultural change and blending in the 1830s and 40s. When John Neely Bryant came to Dallas, he was assisted in his survey by a Cherokee. Uh, for the next couple of years, we had a lot of raids against the incoming settlers. In 1841, the Peters Colony Land Grant started trying to bring in settlers to this uh, dallas Collin County area. And uh, in fact, when John Neely Bryant uh, basically built his cabin in 1841, he was able to talk Caddo and Comanche people into kind of withdrawing and letting him build in his area. When I did this presentation a few years ago, a similar one for a group in Tarrant County, they were most interested in the Battle of Village Creek, which many of you may have heard of, uh, occurred in 1841 under General Tarrant. And what they found in the uh, Village Creek area, which is just south of Lake Arlington, were uh, several villages, over 225 lodges, and they estimated probably about 1,000 Indian warriors. At that time, Village Creek was known as Caddo Creek. So that gives us an idea of who some of these Native American residents of our area were. And in fact, we do know that they fought Caddo, Anadarko, Kichai, and Wacos. Uh, these were members of the Caddo Confederacy and the Wichita Confederacy. 
But I found it interesting, and I don't find many people who realize that the principal Indians that they fought on Village Creek in Arlington were Cherokees, also Creeks, Seminoles, Kickapoos. These are Indians from the Southeast and the Northeast of the, of the United States, not really local residents for very many years in 1841. And the reason was primarily because of the 1830 Indian Removal Act where Andrew Jackson um, basically moved the uh, many tribes west of the Mississippi into what was to become Indian territory. So you know about the, the Cherokee Trail of Tears, the, the Creeks and other of uh, the uh, five civilized tribes had their own Trail of Tears, including the Seminoles. So they were showing up in our area in the 1830s, along with the Kickapoo, who were removed from uh, Illinois and Indiana down to Kansas, which was at that time part of Indian Territory. And many of the Kickapoo came into Oklahoma, came into our area of Texas, and even to Mexico, where a number of them still live today as dual citizens of Mexico and the United States. But I found it interesting that in 1838, a Kickapoo village on the Trinity River in the Arlington area was attacked by soldiers of the Texas Republic. So that's another group who lived with, uh, with our area. And the Comanches, some of the uh, folks back in the 1840s uh, said the Comanches were at Village Creek. They, they may have been, but primarily what the soldiers found were uh, agricultural fields and, and these Caddo and, and Cherokee that we've talked about. Bird's Fort was founded in late 1841, basically at where the Viridian uh, housing project is now. Um, it was founded to protect against Indian attack, but a few months later it was abandoned because of the threat of Comanches. I was out there the other day looking around. They have a, a, a street now at Viridian called Bird's Fort Trail, and here is an oxbow lake where the, the fort may have existed. It was somewhere in this area at any rate. And at Bird's Fort in 1843, uh, the first treaty of the uh, Republic of Texas was signed. Now you all in Coppell know that this treaty negotiation really started at Grapevine Springs there in the Coppell area. But because of various delays, the negotiations moved to Bird's Fort. And finally, that treaty was signed by Caddo, Anadarko, Tawakani, Waco, and Kicha, all basically native to this area, but also signed by Cherokee, Delaware, Chickasaw, Biloxi, and Ioni. So here again, we have a lot of intrusive Indians in our area because of the Indian Removal Act, among other things. This treaty really established a boundary line and they were trying to, to push the Indians to the west of that boundary. It authorized trading posts to be uh, uh, set up so that uh, people could trade uh, legally, and it opened the area for settlement. And settlement did begin to really happen here with Colonel Middleton Tate Johnson establishing what later became Arlington, and James Parrish moved into your area in Coppell, and I know you all probably know a lot about him. In 1849, Fort Worth was founded, and where was it founded? Where the Comanches often camped, and it was there in, near the old courthouse in downtown Fort Worth, uh, as protection against the Comanches in Kiowa. And a uh, visitor to the fort in 1849 talked about all the Wichita Indians that he saw there. I'm not sure how many people know there was a Battle of Fort Worth in 1849, but there again, Caddo and Comanches attacked Tonkawas who fled to Fort Worth and the soldiers there gave three cow carcasses to the attacking Caddo and Comanche to get them to go away and leave the Tonkwa alone. And, and Tarrant County was set up basically along the eastern edge of what they saw then as Comanche territory uh, to kind of be a buffer against the Comanches. And again, in early Fort Worth history, we have recordings of Caddo, Waco, Ioni, Comanche, and your area of Grapevine Prairie. And uh, in 1861, from Bluff Street in Fort Worth, 200 cattle lodges could be seen on Marine Creek. Just a, a quick sidelight here, uh, Cynthia Ann Parker, who many of you know was a famous captive of the Comanches, uh, the Comanche in Kiowa, kidnapped her from her home down near Mahia in 1836. 
when that raid took place, those warriors came right up here to the Fort Worth, Dallas area, probably somewhere in, in the Mansfield, uh, Kennedale area. And then uh, later on, 24 years later, Cynthia Ann was recaptured by Sol Ross and, and Charles Goodnight and spent a lot of time here in the Birdville area. Uh, and in Fort Worth where this famous photo of she and her daughter Prairie Flower was taken. Her son Quanah Parker spent time in Fort Worth and Dallas attending such things as the stock show and the state fair. And finally, the last Kiowa raid occurred in Tarrant County in 1867 uh, near Eagle Mountain Lake today. So there was a lot of Indian activity in this area, a lot of Indian Native American residents in this area, including as we're going to see in just a moment, we'll look more carefully at these, the Comanche, Kiowa, Wichita, Caddo, and Tonkawa, as well as these recent Southeast and Northeast tribes, which because they were so recent, we won't spend uh, much time talking about them. This is a map that um, shows in, in the best way they could, kind of the territories of some of these Indians, although these people, especially the Tonkawa, Comanche, Kiowa, were nomadic and they moved around a lot. So uh, we're gonna talk about these five, the Kiowa, Comanche, Tonkawa, Wichita, and Caddo. But as I say, they all either lived in this area or certainly traveled through this area. And that's why we wanna take a look at them. The first group we'll look at is the one that was mentioned when I asked, who do you think lived here? And that is the Comanches. Um, this map shows them right up here at the headwaters of the Brazos, but the Comanche lived all over the place. Uh, Comancheria, as they used to call it, their, their territory really ranged from not just uh, Texas here, but into New Mexico plains, up into Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, and even down into Mexico. So when we think about Comancheria, it's not just this little area here, but a vast area uh, in the, in the uh, early and mid and late 1800s. In fact, uh, the Comanches often say that they are the only Plains Indian tribe that actually had a coastline. They came down to the coast at times to raid and, and to, um, to, to get horses and things like that. So uh, if you've read the book, Empire of the Summer Moon or any of the uh, other similar books, you certainly know that the Comanches were in this area. Uh, they camped in the Botanic Gardens area. They lived along Village Creek and in Mansfield and up north of Sherman. Um, recently, I've been involved in some projects that had to do with the Comanches in Dallas and in Tarrant County as we're looking for marker trees and trails and, and other signs of Comanche occupation. Um, now, Comanche, I think, is interesting. It's really a Ute word meaning enemy or more accurately, someone who wants to fight me all the time. This will give you an idea of the type of life that a lot of the Comanches lived and, and basically had to live, as we'll see in a moment. They spoke a Uto Aztecan language. It was uh, a language from the Shoshonean branch. And basically, the Comanches started out as Northern Shoshones. They were very poor hunter-gatherers in the Great Basin, Wyoming area, and they began to move south along the eastern edge of the Rockies uh, because primarily uh, they were being pushed by other tribes. And this is a this is a theme that we're going to see for almost all the groups we talk about. Lots of uh, combat between the groups, and one group pushing another one, usually south. In the 1600s, the Comanches obtained horses. They were foot people up till then, pedestrians. And that's something that a lot of people don't realize. But they quickly became a horse culture, a warrior culture when they got horses. And in fact, that may be one reason they were more interested in moving south because the horses at that time were coming uh, primarily from places like the Pueblos in New Mexico. Again, the, the Comanches kept pushing south into Colorado, then into New Mexico. And when I say they migrated, and this is true of all the groups we're gonna talk about, the migrations were not as one large group because they really didn't consider themselves a tribe like we try to make them into a tribe. They were really into bands. 
And these bands were family groups and larger groups of families that moved together. And so they arrived here and, and they arrived in other places in small bands. They were in Texas about a little after 1700 probably with their horses and they hunted buffalo here in the summer and the fall. And I thought this was interesting. They used to come into the Cross Timbers area of uh, Arlington and, and uh, Parker County to hunt black bear in the Cross Timbers. Originally, there were more than 12 bands of Comanches, we think, but by the mid 1800s, we really have five bands and, and membership in these bands was very fluid. You could move from one band to the other if you wanted to. And in fact, we know, for example, that um, uh, Quanta Parker did move from band to band. He started in the Nakoni band and ended up with the Quahati band up in the Panhandle. In our area, the, uh, the most prevalent bands of Comanches were the Nakoni. And of course, Nakona, Texas gets its name from that band. And also the Pentateuca, who were the southernmost band, often down in the San Antonio and Austin area. And as I said, all the way to the coast. Comanche camps were uh, notable by being very large, often taking up miles along stream beds, uh, partly because they needed a lot of pasture for the horses, because as I showed in a previous slide there, some of the warriors had more than 100 horses at times. They moved their camps frequently. These were nomads. They needed to move frequently for food and water and also pasture for their horses. So it wasn't uncommon to see bands move like within a 300 mile radius. Um, Cynthia Ann Parker talks about the fact that her, the band that she was with camped near San Antonio, Austin, um, up in our area, north of Sherman, uh, over to the Panhandle and even in New Mexico and Southern Colorado. So these folks moved a lot and they used a lot of well-marked trails. I mentioned the marker trees, these are trees that the uh, Comanches basically bent over as saplings, caused them to grow parallel to the ground for a while, and then they released them to grow straight up. And these marker trees mark trails, they mark low water crossings along rivers and that sort of thing. The Comanches had a lot of power places, primarily uh, high elevation places like Medicine Mounds out near Quanta, Texas. Uh, Comanche Peak over near the uh, Glen Rose Granberry area. They used these uh, often for smoke signal uh, communication and they had a great system of uh, smoke signal communication from Santa Ana Peaks out in Coleman County, maybe Kennedale Mountain south of Arlington. That's what I've been working with lately. And uh, they also of course use these high points as lookout areas. They did trade a lot with the Comancheros over in New Mexico, with the Wichita and Quichai in our area, with the French up at Monte County, uh, also all the way over into Natchitoches, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. They would often trade, they needed the agricultural goods that these Caddoan and Pueblo people grew, and they would trade horses, cattle, bison hides, and even captives. They brought a lot of Apaches from Southwest Texas and also residents out of Mexico, and they would trade them to the French to use as slaves, as servants. They also intermarried a lot with captives and gave them a great diversity in the Comanche tribe. After 200 years of war, they were certainly really good warriors. Uh, a lot of the war was, um, they, it was self-defense against people like the Blackfeet, the Pawnee and the Osage. They did make treaties with the Kiowa and with the Wichita in our area, and so they, they uh, uh, were allied with them after the mid-1700s in the case of the Wichita and 1790 in the case of the Kiowas. And this is something that I always find interesting. They often would go on raids that were hundreds of miles, sometimes a thousand miles in length. Um, all the way down into Mexico from Canada, for uh, from Kansas, for example. So um, they would often be gone for months or even sometimes uh, a year or two on these long raids. Uh, basically, the Texas, the, the state of Texas, tried to put them on reservations in 1854 here in uh, uh, the Brazos River area, and then in 1859 moved them to Indian Territory. But it wasn't until the 1874 Red River War and then 
Finally, Quanah surrendered in 1875. The uh, people who we look at as uh, often with the Comanches were the Kiowa, again, a Uto Aztecan speaking group. Their language was related to some Eastern New Mexico Pueblos, interestingly enough. Their name for themselves means basically a people who paint the two halves of the body or the face different colors. And we're gonna see that most Texas Indians were highly painted and highly tattooed. Again, the Kiowa were, were pushed from Western Montana to Eastern Montana and then down the front range into our area. Uh, they did align with the Comanches, as I said, in 1790. And uh, frequently they were found in the 1800s up along the uh, Canadian River in the Panhandle, but they made it into our area also. Again, raided over long distances, uh, found some sources talked about Kiowas going all the way into Belize, which is south of Mexico, of course. They were the most Plains culture people in Texas. They practiced vision quests as um, all of the Plains people did, but they also were the only Texas group that practiced the sun dance, where they would get the whole tribe together in the summer for several days of endurance dancing. They also kept elaborate histories by painting pictures in large spirals on uh, bison hides. Later, they transferred this to um, this, this art form to, to paper called ledger art. The Wichita uh, are, were in our area. They are a Caddoan speaking people related, the language is related to the Caddo and the Kichi who lived in our area and we've mentioned them already but also Pawnee and Arikara who were on up in the Nebraska and uh, North and South Dakota area. The Wichita may have originated from the Red River in Louisiana and moved north in prehistoric times. Um, and later they were viewed in this area as being Nortenos from the north. Uh, Coronado found Wichita people in central Kansas in 1541. Uh, the Osage, then Comanches and Apaches pushed them south. They were in Texas by 1719, and in our area, they began to really consolidate into larger villages due to all the attacks they were suffering. Uh, their most famous uh, uh, villages were along the Red River up in Monte County and across the Red River in Oklahoma, this area called Spanish Fort. The Wichita and the Caddo's both lived in grass houses that some people call uh, haystack houses or beehive houses. And they also had these arbors that did not have sides on them so that they could uh, be cooler in the summertime. The Wichita include a lot of bands that you all have heard of in this area, Tawakani, Lake Tawakani, um, Wacos, the Kichai, all of whom signed that Sam Houston Treaty that we talked about. In fact, here's the Wichita flag, the Wichita tribe flag, showing not just the Wichita, but the Waco, the Kichai, and the Tawakani. I like this term, hunter-gardeners. Um, almost all the Indians we talk about were hunter-gatherers, meaning that they hunted and they gathered natural uh, plant foods that they could find. But but uh, the Wichita grew a lot of their food. They were good agriculturalists growing corn, bean, and squash. Uh, but after the harvest in the winter and uh, after they had planted in the summer, they would go on long bison hunts. They became Plains Indians, even though they were essentially sedentary the rest of the year. They would live in teepees. They got horses about 1700. So before that, they were doing their bison hunting on foot, but then they became horse hunters after they got horses. The French called them tattooed Pawnees because they were so highly tattooed. They called themselves the raccoon eyed people because of all of their facial tattoos, especially around the eyes. And uh, like so many of our other groups, they were placed on a reservation by the state and by the feds in 1854 and then moved again to uh, Oklahoma in 1859. During the Civil War, a lot of the Wichita's moved north again to uh, Kansas, and in fact, in the area that's now called Wichita, Kansas. Closely related to the Wichita and named in a lot of the historic slides that we looked at were the Caddo people. They spoke a Caddoan language, just like the Wichita, the Pawnee, and the Arikara. 
Unlike the rest of the Indians that we're talking about, the Caddo basically looked to the Southeast for their culture. They were part of the Mississippian cultures. They were very similar, for example, to the Natchez who were in the uh, Natchez, Mississippi area. This map shows a lot of the Mississippian cultures all the way from the East Coast to our area. The Caddo's were basically the, the westernmost group of Mississippian mound building cultures. Unlike a lot of these groups that we had talked about who were pushed around and who had to migrate, the Caddo held their homeland for well over a thousand years from before 800 AD until the 1800s. Um, and you can see on this map a representation of where their, their area was, East Texas, uh, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. And as you know, uh, I mentioned they lived on Village Creek, which was called Caddo Creek. Caddo people lived around the Marine Creek area near Billy Bob's in Fort Worth. Uh, they signed the Sam Houston Treaty. And you all in Capel have uh, the Caddo Indian Mounds. When I looked at some of the website information, I was intrigued by uh, the Caddo Indian Mounds that I saw there. And there's a really good paper on the Historic Society website by uh, Becky Shelton that basically says that these are not really constructed mounds uh, by humans. They are natural high rises, but uh, the Caddo and other people before the Caddo settled and lived on those. As I mentioned, the Caddo in this area were not really mound builders. Uh, the mounds stopped uh, several counties east of Dallas County. Uh, these people in this area lived in grass covered houses like the Wichita, as we mentioned. Um, when the historic period began, there were basically three Caddo Confederacies, the Caddo Adacho up in the Red River, the bend of the Red River area near uh, the Red River in Louisiana. Um, Hassanai, who were the largest group in East Texas, they, of course, are the ones who gave us the uh, word Tejas, meaning friend, that later became Tejas and in Texas, and the Natchitoches, who were basically in the western Louisiana area along the Red River. The um, Caddo had a class system, unlike the other groups that we are looking at, because the other groups were basically all egalitarian with a few uh, people elected to lead them at various times. But the Caddo had a hereditary, uh, hereditary chief called a Chinesi who uh, would conduct an annual renewal ceremony and speak to two spirit boys, a uh, very interesting uh, practice, uh, who had been sent to help the Caddo, give them advice, et cetera. And he spoke for those boys and told his people what he wanted them to do. The Caddo often built ceremonial centers around temple mounds during their mound building period. Um, and they, these were surrounded by lots of little settlements, little hamlets where people were farming and raising crops, et cetera. This is one of the mounds at the Caddo Mounds Park down at Alto, Texas. Uh, this is the site where the tornado hit a few years ago and, and really wiped out the museum and the grass covered house that I just showed you a picture of. Uh, it's all being rebuilt now, but that was a, a really a terrible tragedy. Mound building in East Texas and, and to the east and the rest of the southeastern United States really reached its height about 1500 and was basically stopped in the 1700s. And as I said, never really occurred in this area. Just one other thing I was going to mention about the Caddo's, which I find very interesting, uh, they had a uh, practice of weeping and wailing. They're well known as weeping and wailing people when they met uh, somebody, and especially if they met a stranger, uh, sometimes they would weep and wail for 30 minutes as just a sort of a ceremonial way of saying hello. And the Spanish and the French who came into the area in the early historic periods were struck by this um, unusual practice of the Caddo's. The Caddo were great uh, hide tanners. They made really good baskets and beautiful pottery. And then they traded a lot of these goods. They were known as very active traders with the French and even with the Pueblos in New Mexico, uh, sometimes through middle people, uh, a Humano group, for example. 
But I found it interesting in, in, in 1542, when Moscoso was through this area, he found turquoise and cotton cloth from the Pueblos in New Mexico were there in at Guasco, whether it was on the Trinity River or the Brazos River, it had been traded in from the West. And also the uh, Caddo, what they traded to, to other peoples were finished bows for bow and arrow uh, fighting. They also traded uh, bodark wood, which is uh, basically only grown in, in our area and to the, to the East and salt, which they produced from salt springs, et cetera. This is some Caddo pottery. I just thought I would throw a picture of some really pretty pottery in there. I will move on to the Tonkawas at this point. Uh, the Tonkawa, no, we don't know what kind of language they spoke because there are no Tonkawa speakers left today. We think it might have been related to Coyotecan, which came out of the South Texas, North uh, Mexico area. These folks we know had a lot of enemies, the Apaches, the Wichita. You remember I mentioned the Battle of Fort Worth where the Caddo and Comanche attacked the Tonkawa in our area. Tonkawa is really from a Wichita word, meaning they all stay together. And they all stayed together for protection because they were being pushed from the north and also from the south. So the original Tonkawa band absorbed a lot of other small bands from the Texas coast and from uh, Coila in, in northeastern uh, uh, Mexico. And even groups who came down from Oklahoma in the, the late 16 and early 1700s. So by the 1700s, the Tonkawa were living in various camping places, settlements from the Red River all the way down to the coastal plain. And I found it interesting on a 1763 map of the Dallas area, there is a Tonkawa village indicated there. The Tonkawa were basically a plains culture, hunting buffalo and, and living in uh, teepees. They, they were the only group who really considered themselves a tribe in the 1800s because they, again, they needed to ally uh, with other people for protection. And they often served as scouts with the army against the Comanches. That's my 33 minute uh, uh, notice. So I will now finish up as quickly as I can here. The Tonkawa were known uh, to practice ritual cannibalism, although a lot of other in, uh, Texas Native Americans did also. But this is not eating uh, human flesh for our food, but to obtain the, the good qualities, the power of the other person. So if you captured a brave warrior from another tribe and, and ate a part of his finger or something, that was uh, expected to transfer a lot of his bravery to you. Also, it was a way, if they wanted to, to insult the victim and, and they thought it might destroy the soul so that the person would not be able to, to have um, any happiness in the next life. Well, we've been spending the last 33 minutes or so looking at the historic tribes in our area from the 1500s on. But I just wanted to close by taking a very brief look at the cultures that came before these people. Before the historic pe period, we don't know the names of various groups, tribes, bands who lived in our area. But we as uh, archaeologists and anthropologists put some cultural names to those groups. And we try to come up with the chronology showing who was here first and second and third. So as we go back in time, we've got, we're gonna look very quickly at the late prehistoric period, archaic period and paleo Indians. And in fact, as you know, archeologists uh, are famous for digging, for excavating sites, and we do this very carefully so that we can know the relative age of things that what was the lowest at our site, so normally the oldest artifact, and then as we come up, what was younger and younger. And when you do this enough and keep good enough records and combine it with hard dates from things like charcoal, C14 dating and so forth, you get a good chronology. This is a chronology of Central Texas cultures starting down here at the earliest time period with Paleo Indians coming up through archaic time period 
and they call it neo-archaic, uh, we would call it late prehistoric. This is, as I said, for Central Texas, each area has its own cultural sequence. Here's one from the Becky Shelton paper I mentioned earlier, but this is for our area of North Texas. So we have a Paleo-Indian period, um, 13,000, 12,000 years ago. We've got the early middle and late archaic. And finally, just before the historic period that we were talking about, we've got a late prehistoric one and two. This is a, pan, a uh, poster produced by the Texas Department of Transportation showing over here at 13,000 years ago, the, what at that time was uh, considered the oldest culture in Texas, the Clovis people, followed by the Folsom people and so forth. So we're gonna talk real quickly about these. Clovis was uh, for many, many years considered to be the first inhabitants, as I said. So we have what we call the Clovis first hypothesis, which lately has pretty much uh, been disproved, but it was believed for years that around 13,000 years ago, this was the oldest culture in our, in, really in the, in the new world. Um, we, these folks were big game hunters. They hunted mammoths. They produced these beautiful Clovis points, often out of exotic materials. And typical of these, you've got this, uh, a flake removed here at the base called fluting the point. These points were put on the end of a spear, or we call them darts, but they were not arrowheads. In fact, bows and arrows didn't come into our area until 500, 600, 700 AD. So for the first uh, 13, 14,000 years of prehistory here, people were using these darts and they would throw them using an atlatl or a dart thrower. I mentioned mammoths that these, that these folks hunted. There are mammoths, of course, being found at Lake Grapevine at, in Parker County. We, our group just uh, helped excavate a mammoth a few years ago. Down at Waco, there is the uh, uh, Waco mammoth site. This is a, um, a uh, painting from there. And I really highly recommend if you have not visited the Waco mammoth site, and especially if you have children or grandchildren, it's a fabulous place to go and see uh, mammoths and other prehistoric animals still in the ground, a uh, very good place to take children. The Clovis people were highly mobile and they're found, their, their artifacts are found basically everywhere from Canada to Mexico. And it was originally thought they came out of Siberia. However, I wanted to bring this up because Texas is fortunate to have two really great sites that are producing a lot of information about cultures that were here before the Clovis people. One of those sites is the Galt site, and here they've got a lot of Clovis activity in this layer, but further down is the pre-Clovis area. The Galt site, you can actually visit it. They do tours there, and I highly recommend that you um, go online and Google the Galt site and, and try to set up a tour. I took one uh, about a year and a half ago, and it was fabulous. This is down near Salado. If you just take 35 to Salado and go a little bit west, you'll be there. But they're finding artifacts that are like 16,000 years old and it's not Clovis technology. They're stemmed points and they're, they have lancelate points, but they're not fluted. The Friedkin site is basically next door to the Galt site. In fact, it's really, I think, gonna be a continuation of the Galt site. But uh, again, they're finding artifacts that are more than 15,000 years old and the same uh, stemmed points and lancelite points and a lot of other pre-Clovis sites. So we know now that Clovis probably uh, was not the first culture in our area. About 8,500 years ago, the climate began to dry out. Uh, the megafauna had all basically gone extinct, all these mammoths and large bison that people hunted. And the uh, sites that I read about in your area along Denton Creek, which Jan, uh, had, Jan um, had helped uh, to excavate and document, um, also Cottonwood Creek and Grapevine Springs, a lot of your area has archaic sites attached to it. And we, as archeologists uh, tend to do, we try to, to group these into early, middle, and archaic, uh, I'm sorry, early, middle, and late archaic, 
Um, the early archaic, for example, we've got some pretty crude points called Gower points, and we've got Martindale points. The middle archaic, uh, a lot more local materials. These people were seem to be traveling a lot less and trading a lot less than the Clovis people had years before them. We have a middle archaic point called the Carrollton point, and I'm sure you can imagine where they were first documented. The late archaic, we seem to get a little wetter and the cross timbers may have actually expanded, uh, giving a lot more food to the local people. We've got points from the late archaic that include the Gary point, Trinity point, and the Ellis point. And finally, we get to what um, a lot of people will call me and say they want me to come and look at their arrowheads, and they actually are all dark points that we've been talking about. But these small points that many people end up calling bird points uh, actually are arrow points that probably came into being here um, somewhere around five to 700 AD and then on into the historic period. We tend to divide these uh, in a lot of Texas into Austin phase and Toria phase. The earlier Austin phase is characterized by Scalarin points and Alba. In this area, we have a lot of Alba and Bonham points. The Toria phase is produced points used a lot for hunting bison. They're very small, but they will kill a buffalo. And they have these long, thin stems. In fact, our logo for the North Texas Archaeological Society is a, a, a produce point found in Parker County. So as we wrap up, who was here, what cultures? We've talked about these historic tribes, as well as the people that uh, very early came here 16,000 years ago or more, the Paleo Indians, later in the, in the archaic period and the late prehistoric. And before I close, I did want to put a word out there for the North Texas Archaeological Society. If you're interested, you can find us online. Our website is ntxas.org. We have monthly meetings by Zoom. And in fact, the next one is coming up in a couple of weeks. It's the second Thursday of every month. And uh, visitors are welcome. So if you contact us through that website, or if you want to contact the library and have them tell me that you're interested, I'll get you on our mailing list. Same thing for the Texas Archaeological Society. Uh, we do things like an annual field school where we train people to do archaeology work. And this year we'll be in Kerrville, Texas in June. And uh, you're welcome to come. And we have a great children's program also. With that, I will stop talking and ask if there are any questions here or if any were submitted by um, by the uh, chat facility. Uh, we don't have any in the chat right now, but you know, I encourage everybody to, you can go ahead and unmute and ask a question or you can type one into the chat if you prefer. Hey, Sarah, <clears throat> uh, not really a question, just a comment. I uh, appreciate the presentation, James. Uh, and it's kind of timely for me. Uh, we had a uh, uh, grab, grab and go book bag sale, the, the uh, friends did. And one of the books I got is a, uh, and it was purely by accident because you don't know what's going to be in the bag, except that it's a mystery. Uh -huh. But this is a nonfiction, Killers of the Flower Moon, uh, based on a true story of the Osage Indians up in the Tulsa area in the mid 19th century. I don't know if you're yes. familiar with them. Oh, yes. It was a fascinating story about oil and all kinds of stuff that happens after it. Well, and it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a sad part of our history, but it's one that we have to face and be honest about if we're going to make progress. And so, yeah, that is a sad, sad tale. And at the Osage, along with a lot of the folks that we talked about here, ended up in Oklahoma, of course. But yeah. even mm -hmm. that wasn't good enough for a lot of people. They had to try to take oil and other things that, that the uh, tribes ended up with. So, yeah, that is a, it's a sad but very interesting story. Yeah. And, and it, it, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago. It was almost, well, I guess 100 years ago now, but it wasn't that long ago, really. Yeah. I'd like to add something to that. Please. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. The, uh, I have that book, and it was given to me by a fellow who was uh, from that area. I think he had relatives that were part of the tribe. His name is Chris 
Chris Freeman, and he lives in Plano. Uh, he's, he's been talking to me about the book for the last couple of years and informed me that it's now being made into a movie mm -hmm. uh, with stars, including Robert De Niro and oh, wow. Matt, Matt Damon. The book is also cited as being a great historical reference for how the FBI started. Mm. It was a matter of investigating the, uh, some of the atrocities of whites against the, the native Indians and stealing their, their property rights, their oral rights, and how the uh, FBI later was involved in trying to track down uh, killers and swindlers and uh, all kinds of uh, terrible characters that, that defrauded the, uh, the Indians of their rights. So look for the movie in a theater near you. <laughs> Good. Well, I, I remember when the book came out, it got really rave reviews. It, it is uh, well written, I think. Fascinating book, it really is. Any other questions about anything we talked about or anything we didn't talk about? Well, I, I'll just say a couple of things. One, and I, I was born and raised in this area. And, you know, as you drive the freeways and the high five and that sort of thing, you just don't think about this area as a, uh, a place where a lot of Native Americans lived. When I go to New Mexico, Arizona, other places, yes, it's more apparent, but here not so much. But if you start looking at our historical records and then the prehistoric <clears throat> records, there, is a, there was a lot of Native American activity in this area, a lot of residents a lot of diversity among the Native Americans and well worth studying. So I hope this will help you get even more interested. Is there a hand with Vera Gibbs? Is that a hand up or? <laughs> yes, it's me. Okay. <laughs> here I am right here. Yeah. Um, my question is how do they determine the percentage uh, of um, Native Americans, I guess, in the area? Um, what? because there's so many mixed races now, how do they determine the percentage of who's what and how do they get their stats? Well, as far as I could tell, like the Dallas 1.1% was from the latest census. And you know, a lot of the census is based on self-determination. So you tell the census taker what you are. And, mm -hmm. and so, I mean, I think that's where it came from. And I used to teach a lot of diversity courses. And one of the things you really, it, it's a head scratcher when you get into um, things dealing with, with race and culture and because there's so many ways of looking at it and even sometimes people don't know how to classify themselves at times. So basically though, these stats were from the census and they were self-determined. Uh, I got you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Certainly. James, I have a question. Um, the the only reservation that I recall, at least, is the Alabama Quesada Reservation still in Texas? Yes, and, it is. Yes, okay, it is. Were they from Louisiana or? They they, they were. It's it's interesting. The um, the Alabama and the Quesada are re some, somewhat related, certainly linguistically. And I thought it was interesting that. Um, the Spanish in, uh, welcomed them into Texas at one point, uh, and they came out of Louisiana and, and the Southeast and came into the Southern part of Texas. They weren't really in our area, but, uh, but certainly South of here, and that reservation is still uh, intact. Okay. In fact, I think there are only two real reservations. Well, there are several small ones, but there's this res that reservation, uh, there's a small Pueblo reservation in um, the El Paso area, and the, mm -hmm. Kickapo the Kickapoos have a reservation, a presence down in the Eagle Pass area, but very small. Okay, and those were set up by the uh, United, the U.S. government. Uh, generally, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Great. Yes, this is Grace. Uh, you mentioned that the Indians use trees to mark their trails as they traverse the country. Mm -hmm. How have those trails 
influenced our current transportation system markings for our byways and highways? Now, was the question, how have those trees influenced the current transportation marking? Well, the trees themselves, that fascinated me that that's how they used to mark it. But I'm curious as those trails, how they have come forward and translated in today's civilization. Um, I, I'm not sure I can tell you exactly that. That uh, Well, first of all, we know that a lot of the early roads that settlers used were actually along uh, Indian trails. And in fact, the Indian trails often were along what were game trails. So, you know, there is a, there is a, a connection there in the past. Um, as far as the uh, actual Comanche trails, a lot of them uh, are in very rural areas, so they're, they're still there, and, and they're just not used a lot by people these days. For example, out in Crane County, there's a crossing at Horsehead Crossing along the Pecos River. The crossing is still there. It's just way out in the middle of no place, and, and nobody uses it. But um, the, the uh, Native Americans, and, and this is something that I'm just getting into in Dallas and Tarrant counties, but um, there was a famous marker tree at Gateway Park in South Dallas, uh, Southeast Dallas. Um, and these trees, of course, would have to be well over 100 years old, and, and many of them 200 years old. And these, um, the, the oak trees can live that long at times. Uh, many of them are gone now. That one in Gateway was destroyed by a thunderstorm several years ago. But um, they, we, some of them were documented long ago, and we're trying to find as many as we can now because they're, they're not going to last forever. But they marked certain areas that, uh, along the trail. They would mark low, low water crossings on um, rivers. They would mark uh, places where there was a good place to camp. They would mark the uh, location of uh, flint or chert and other resources that people needed. So they were well understood by the people who used them at the time. Thank you, this is fascinating. It, I find it really fascinating. And, and the more you read, the more interesting it becomes. I was wondering, uh, one of the things that tends to happen in history, especially with what I'm what I'm seeing today is the, just a a lot of point the blame at uh, white people for bad things that they've done against everybody, which you know I think it kind of goes overboard sometimes. But what I find fascinating is that there was quite a bit of skirmish fighting amongst these different tribes, and uh, sometimes that gets lost in the whole. Uh, historical review when uh, Indians are painted as like everybody's getting along and white people came along and robbed them of this, that, and the other thing. But there's there's quite a bit of fighting for territory. And I, I just wanted you to say a little bit about what were the uh, elements involved and why tribes fought against each other? What were they trying to grasp or defend? Right, okay. Well, first of all, that's a very astute observation. I tried not to spend too much time outlining the enemies that everybody had, but um, <laughs> there, there was a lot of fighting going on, unfortunately. Um, we can start by talking about that, you know, humans seem to be kind of violent by nature in, in many ways, and you have to, to work for your better angels to come out, not to be violent. Um, but for example, uh, when you've got uh, various groups, you know, each group seems to think that, well, we're, we're okay, but other people aren't so good. And that's another basic human uh, element that just happens. Now, when you look at what was causing a lot of this, some of it is just uh, territorial. For example, if you're a hunter-gatherer and you're doing fine, you're, you're going over here for a few days and hunt deer, and then over there a few days and hunt bison, um, that's good. But then all of a sudden, another group appears on the horizon, and they want to hunt your deer, and they want to hunt your bison. It leads to conflict. And so a lot of the conflict was groups being pushed, and you can go back way, way back to the Iroquois, and they're getting pushed by the early English settlers, so then they're having to 
to go east and then they bump into the Sioux who have to go east, I meant west, and then they bump into people like the Comanches and they push them south. So this is, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a, a mm. domino effect, but a lot of it uh, stemmed from fighting for resources, basically survival. Those, the Tonquas that we talked about, they, they who stay together because they had to stay together because they had so many people pushing the, um, a lot of Indian groups from Mexico were being pushed north by the, by the people who were living in Mexico and other groups were being pushed south by these incoming Comanches and others. So they were getting kind of squashed in the middle and they had to fight a lot of folks. So it, it, a lot of it is uh, re related to resource utilization and resource scarcity. You spoke a bit about prehistoric uh, developments. Where, where would you point as a uh, beginning point or a point of origin for the various Indians that were here? You know, when Columbus got over here, they're already here. Where, where do you cite them as coming from? Well, here again, there's a lot of recent research that I think is going to help rewrite uh, what we think we know. Uh, but yeah. I'm sure you and most people on the call here have uh, at least for years and years heard of the Bering Strait. And during the Ice Age, the, uh, the ocean retreated enough that there was dry land between Asia and the United States or uh, and, uh, the New World. And a lot of people came over through that land bridge. So there is a connection. And, and we're seeing a lot of DNA studies now that do show uh, connection to people in uh, Eastern Asia, for example. So a lot of folks arrived that way. There's more and more study being done to people who may have come along the ocean currents uh, from Japan and, and other places to places along the west coast of California and down into Peru, et cetera. So there's more DNA coming in from there. There's even a, a group looking at influences from Europe, the Salutrians who came from Spain and, and uh, France along the uh, ice barrier and came to the east coast to the United States. So there's a, a lot of mixing, but I think primarily you're going to see the, uh, the people originated in uh, Eastern Asia, Siberia area, and came over that land bridge. But there's a lot of other groups arriving through a lot of other means. Does that, does that sort of address your question? And so ancestors.com ancestors is going, going back to Europe and uh, Asia, right? I tell you what, the, uh, these are wonderful tools that are really going to end up hel helping us write a lot of the story of how people got to be where they are and who they are. It's wonderful. Great. Thank you. Oh, certainly. Anything else? Oh, I guess it is because everybody's gone, maybe. Well, if there isn't, I do want to thank you all. This was, uh, it's always, I, I learn more when I do one of these than anybody in the audience. So I thank you for the opportunity to study some more and to learn some more. And uh, I really enjoyed meeting with you all. And I just have to, again, congratulate Capel for what you're doing to try to broaden the understanding people have of their neighbors and of who we live near. It's, it's really uh, refreshing and I think it's really necessary. So uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Janice or Sarah. Thank you so much, James. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, and um, yeah, no, I think we all learned a lot. So we appreciate you coming out and talking to us today and thank you everybody for attending. Um, and yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you all. Have a, have and a great afternoon. Keep keep Bye -bye. up your keep up your good work. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jane. Uh huh. Bye. Bye bye.